This morning, the sermon that I want to, um, that I want to preach to you is, is titled The Battle for Our Identity, The Battle for Your Identity. And, and in it, I want to talk about this idea of identity. Now, identity is one of those words that we can use pretty easily in conversation, and we, we have an idea of what we're talking about, but if you try to just write out a succinct definition of identity, it's actually kind of a difficult term to try to, to, try to define. And um, so this morning, the way that I want to use identity is, is really to mean two things. First, your identity is a sense of self, how you view yourself, and then second, a sense of worth, okay? So it's really those two things. It has to be, there has to be some kind of stable core to who you really are that, that, um, that across the different hats you wear, the different relationships you have, the different places you go. Third service in a row, junior hires, you guys can go. <laughs> For 20 years, I've been running the junior high ministry. Thank you guys. Literally, every single service, without fail. Tis a gift. Um, but your identity has to be some kind of stable core that, that maintains who you are across these different relationships and across these different parts of your life. So your identity is who am I and how do I feel about myself? You know, sometimes when people get rocked by some kind of traumatic event in their life, they'll say something like, I, like I'm not even sure who I am anymore. Or if somebody's been living incongruously with, with who they think themselves to be, they'll say, that's not me. I'm not that person. What, what they're pointing to is that they're referencing their identity, to who they truly believe themselves to be. And every culture has a way of, of helping their citizens to, to formulate or, or to form their identity. And, and usually it's not, um, it's not consciously, it's not something that we talk about, but it is just ingrained within the culture through cultural values and norms, mores and taboos, through stories and myths, the kinds of songs that we sing, we, we begin to, to shape in what does it mean to be an individual in this society? What is your actual identity? One of the ways that identities get um, expressed is through names, right? Your name is a representation of who you are. When you meet someone, you say, hi, I'm Mike. I'm introducing myself, who I am. My name is a representation of myself. A couple weeks ago, I was at the Padre game with my son, Whitfield. We are walking up the aisle, and, and I heard my name, Mike. Okay, so if you have a name like Mike, you're not sure if they're talking to you. I was with my son, Whitfield. If they had named, if they yelled Whitfield, I would have known for sure they were talking about us, because I'm pretty sure there's only one Whitfield. But... Um, Mike, I realized my friend Chad was the section over. He's trying to get my attention. He's just trying to say what's up. But my name is what differentiated me from the 2,000 other people in our section. My name was a representation of who I am. If we say you want to protect your good name, we're saying that there's something about your reputation, who you are, that you need to protect. Colloquially, if someone says, keep my name out of your mouth, they're saying, don't talk about me behind my back. You know, when you... When you meet someone, you introduce yourself, it's, it's a representation of who you are. Um, if you're ever in a spot where you're not sure where you fit in and someone remembers your name, it can be really meaningful. I remember when I first started coming to this church, I didn't really know anybody. And the, the first time I went to the college group, I met a couple people, but I felt really out of place. And the next week when I came back, um, this guy came to me and said, hey, Mike, how's it going? And I remember I was feeling like a little uncomfortable, but automatically my sense of belonging went up because here was this guy who remembered my name. You know, in the Bible, there's a few examples of when, when some of the Hebrews would, were abducted or gone into other cultures, they would change their names, right? So um, in the Bible, Joseph, when he went into Egypt, Pharaoh changed his name to Zaphonaeth Panea. Some, you win some, you lose some, I guess. Um, uh, when when the, the Hebrews were taken off into captivity into Babylon, they changed Daniel's name to Belteshazzar, Hananiah to Shadrach, Mishael to Meshiach, and Azariah to Abednego. And so when they went into these cultures, they were, they were trying to say, we no longer want you to see yourself as Hebrews. We want you to see yourself as an Egyptian or, or not see yourself as a Hebrew, see yourself as a Babylonian. And so they changed their name to help them to acculturate into that culture and to, to define themselves or to see themselves as part of that nationality or that group. God does something similar at different points in the Bible. He changed Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai's name to Sarah. He changed Jacob's name to Israel. Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter. And each one of these name changes came with a different sense of identity. He was changing something about who he wanted them to believe that they were and what their purpose and what their mission was that he was giving them. 
Your name can be important to reveal something core about who you are. You know, the different ways you, 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 you gain this identity historically um, and in many traditional cultures today, the way you would gain your identity is it would be assigned to you by the community that you lived in. You get your identity as you fulfill those roles, those assignments that you have in your family or in your clan or in the, the society around you. The way you're honored is, is by as you, as you sublimate your self-will for the good of the community, right? So either being a brother or a son or a sister or a daughter, of, of being, being the, what the role that you play in the community is where you get your, your identity from. So just quickly, a traditional view of identity um, is the definition is your identity is, assi- is assigned to you by your role in the community and your sense of worth comes from how well you discharge those duties. Again, names can be useful in this. So we all have last names or surnames or family names. Historically, those names evolved over time to sort people into groups by either occupation or place of origin, clan, affiliation, patronage, parentage, adoption, or physical characteristics. My last name is Van Meter. It comes, it's, it's, it's originally Dutch for Van Meteren, which means from Meteren, which is a town in Holland. So my people come from Meteren, Holland. If your last name is Miller, it's because your family were grain millers. If your last name was Smith, it's because you came from blacksmiths. This week I looked up Hoffman is, is German for Huffman. It means they were stewards. And so your last name, and, and it wasn't just that, that someone, your great, great, great grandpa who started your last name was a Smith. It meant that your family, that was your family line, and those are the things you did. You were kind of locked into an occupation. So your great-grandpa, your grandpa, your dad, and you were all going to be blacksmiths if your last name was Smith. I was just kind of playing around with it this week. I I, um, looked up my assistant, Taylor, her last name. And um, when she came to work for me, her name was Taylor DeRosey, and then she married Matt Foreman, a wonderful young man here. He plays on the worship team. Um, He works in the youth ministry. And, um, And his last name is Foreman. And so I looked up her last names, and so Derosia comes from the French Derosier, which means one who lives among roses. Beautiful. She got married to Matt, though. And Matt Foreman, <laughs> Foreman is English for keeper of swine. I got a kick out of that. I texted her. Did you know? In Korean culture, when you meet someone, people will introduce themselves first with their family name and then their first name, or what we would call their first name. And that's symbolic of, of how they viewed themselves and how they viewed their place in society. They primarily view themselves as a part of this greater lineage, this, this greater community of people, and that's where they primarily get their identity from. You are a father or a mother. You are a son or a daughter. Um, you are, and how you feel about yourself is based upon how you discharge those duties. Well, in modern Western culture, we get our identity in very, we shape our identity in very different ways. It's not so much you get your identity from receiving it outside of yourself, but you receive your identity by looking inward and finding out who you truly are. We live in what's called a self-individualized culture. That means that the individual is the most important. The self is seen as relatively independent of greater relational or cultural bonds. And the way you find out who you really are is by looking inward. The primary moral imperative of our cultural landscape is constantly changing, but the one thing that has stayed constant over these last years is be yourself. You have to be true to who you really are. So in contrast, the modern view of identity is your identity is revealed through self-discovery and your self-worth comes from fully embracing your true self. In fact, we look at traditional views of, of identity and cultures and, and we're, we, we're, we repudiate them. We don't, we don't want to have that bondage put on us. We don't want to try to sublimate ourselves to the culture around us, but we want to express our individual value in what's inside of us. And so we tell children, you can be anything you want to be. Do all that's in your heart. Every single one of us is a unique, special individual. That is our default position in how we view ourselves. And yet, in a traditional culture, that would not fly. That would not work. You are not a unique, special individual. You are part of a group pushing in the same direction. That's why in our culture we could say something like, well, that's my truth, or speak your truth. Because truth is derived from what you know in your inner being, your inner emotions and impulses and desires. That's what's true. 
I mean, we express this in lots of different ways. Like I said before, that, that culturally this is expressed to us through stories we tell and songs. And, and um, one of the examples I just like to give this morning is from the song Let It Go from Frozen. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read some of the lyrics real quick, and I want to just kind of interrogate them. Because these are not things we normally think about, but there are messages that are regularly getting thrust upon us. I'm going to read it. I'm going to try not to sing it. The wind is howling like this swirling storm inside. Couldn't keep it in. Heaven knows I've tried. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal. Don't feel. Don't let them know. Well, now they know. Let it go. Let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go. Let it go. Turn away and slam the door. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The, the cold never bothered me anyway. It's funny how some distance makes everything seem small and the fears that once controlled me can't get to me at all. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free, okay? This is a perfect encapsulation of how we view identity. She, she's saying we need to cast off these restraints and these cultural values that people put on us and just really express who we really are from the inside. In her case, an ice princess that wants to, I don't know, <laughs> spray snow everywhere. But that's who I really am. The clearest expression of, of, of the advancement of this kind of expressive individualism is how we understand identity politics or intersectionality or the trans movement. People say things like, I identify as fill in the blank. And for a lot of people, that just settles it. That's the end of the conversation because if you identify as that, if deep down that's who you really are, then you can't question that because that's your truth. That's your, that's your reality. Is, that's the most important thing about you is who you are really deep on the inside. We have um, uh, people today that are, that are having kids and they don't want to assign the gender at birth. They want to let their kid grow up and tell them, are they a boy or a girl? Who are they really? Because that's how you discern what the truth is. That's how you discern what reality is by what's truly inside of them. Okay, so the first part of this message this morning, we haven't even really gotten to the Bible at all. We've, we've just been kind of giving a sociological survey of how we view and understand identity. And the reason I wanted to do that is because whether we like it or not, or whether we know it or not, all of us have grown up in this culture and we have been affected by these ideas. We've been affected by these views of identity. These are all things that we have internalized and that have come to us from the culture we live in. My argument this morning is that neither the traditional view nor the modern view are able to fully and really tell us who we truly are. In fact, the Bible offers us another way of understanding identity. There are hints of truth in both, to be sure, but both of them ultimately fail. Traditional views of identity, they understand rightly your identity needs to come from outside of yourself. You need to be named by someone else. And it also understands that we are linked in very important and deep ways to the community and the people around us. But the traditional view can easily be co-opted to become manipulative or abusive. It can easily allow other people, and we've all experienced this, of people in authority over us or people we're, we looked up to that have, have hurt us in some way or, or have, have used us in some way. That's one of the problems with the traditional view. The modern view gets some things right too. It does have a better understanding of the value of the individual. In fact, if, if it wasn't for this, this, uh, this increase in, the, in this modern view of individual, the importance of the individual, I'm not sure we would have had something like, um, like the civil rights movement. And so there is some value in it. But, but one of the problems is, is that you are not truly your feelings, impulses, and desires. That does not reveal, reveal your true essence. And this is one of the lies that is very subtle, but is very powerful. We see this a lot with the LGBTQ community, the idea behind that is they want to connect our sexual desires with our true identity, who we really are. But listen, you are not your sexual, you are not your sexual desires. How many of you guys are grateful that you're not your sexual desires? Okay. All of us are, are, have some brokenness inside of us, not sexual and otherwise. All of us have broken ideas about ourselves, about the world, about how things work. And that is not who you truly are. And yet we as a world are telling people, that is you. To be true to yourself, you have to embrace this and you have to express this. 
It certainly is untrue. The other problem is that we don't actually have the ability to rightly view ourselves in the first place. Our perception of ourselves is incredibly hard to get. Usually, we're looking at ourselves in some kind of carnival mirror, right? The ones that, that make you tall and skinny, right? Make you look better than you actually are. Or the ones that make you look short and fat and make you look worse than you actually are. You know, some of these, some of these uh, uh, department stores actually figured this out. I don't know if you noticed that. They, they have really good mirrors in the department store. So you go try something on, you think, oh my gosh, I'm looking excellent. Like, this is great, you know? And then you get it home, you're like, what happened to these clothes? They don't look anything like that. And the, the, the converse can be true too. You know, you ever find a mirror that you just, you do not look good in that mirror? Here at the church, um, uh, the doors that go out on the far, the face north on the, the far doors over there, um, if you ever have, if you ever here at night, and you walk, and the lights are on um, in the hallway, and so the, that door kind of operates like a mirror, okay? And so every week after home group, that's where I park. And every week, it doesn't matter how good home group went. It doesn't matter if my Bible study was amazing. As I walk out those doors, I cannot help but feel bad about myself because in that mirror, I know that this is not great, but it is not as bad as that mirror shows as I walk out, okay? It really is like super embarrassing. It's just, it's just a terrible reflection. So if you ever encounter that door, you don't look that bad. Look, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. It's saying we have a problem in this life that we can't see really clearly. It says it's like we're seeing in a mirror dimly. Now, in ancient times, they wouldn't have had mirrors like we have today. They would have just had polished metal. And so when you look at it, you could see a reflection, but it wasn't, it wasn't sharp. It wasn't a clear picture of who you really were. And so they recognize this life, look, this Apostle Paul's writing, this life is kind of like that. It's seeing in a mirror dimly. It's not, it's not clear. It's not obvious. It's not sharp. But then it says, in the context here, he's saying, when Christ returns, he says, but then I will know fully. So in the future, when Christ returns, I will know fully. I will see myself as I truly am. I will see those around me as they truly are. Look what it says. Then I will know fully, just as I also, just, okay, so then in the future, I will know fully just as I also have been, past tense, fully known. That God knows right now, and he's known your whole life exactly who you are. He sees you. He sees the true you for who you really are. So the Christian view of identity is this, that you are insufficient to discover your own identity. Because you were created and because you are dependent on your creator for existence, your identity is not self-discovered. It is not created by you, but it is assigned to you by your creator. You know, last year, my, my kids are homeschooled, and last year in our Bible class, we went through a catechism. And the catechism was based on the historic um, Heidelberg Catechism, which is one of the kind of the, the historical creedal confessions. And, and um, a catechism works like this. It, 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 it's to help you understand your, 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 what you believe deeper. And, and so it's a, a series of questions and answers. And the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism is this. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is this. That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. The fundamental belief of the Christian view of identity is that you are not your own, that God has an ownership claim over you, that you belong to him. The Apostle Paul says this in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, that when Christ died on the cross, so was I. I died up there with him, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. This life that I have right now is not my own. It belongs to him, and the life, it, it is his to live. It's not my life. It's his to live. But I still make decisions. I still make choices about what time I'm going to set my alarm and where I'm going to go and what I'm going to do. This is what it says. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So the Son of God, Jesus, loved me and gave himself up for me. Therefore, I live my life by faith in him, saying, God, what do you want for me? How do you want me to live? How do you want me to maneuver in this world? Where do you want me to go? It's not my life. I don't get to decide who I am or what I want to be. But I figure that out as I walk with him, as I put my trust in him, as I look to him. So, so listen, here's part of it. We've been talking a little bit about names and part of it is this, is that God reserves the right to name you. You know, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, 
Um, God makes everything. He makes the, the earth. He, he, he makes the light, the darkness, his stars, everything. Um, and then he makes all of the living creatures. And then finally he makes Adam. And he tells Adam to go out and he tells him to name all the beasts, all the animals. There's one creature, though, that Adam does not name. He doesn't name himself. See, God calls him to name everything else, but he reserves the right to call Adam what he is because Adam is above the animals, but you have to receive your name from someone greater than yourself. And so God is the one who reserves the right to call Adam. It says in Revelation 2.17 that, that you and I, when we meet Jesus, we are gonna, he's gonna give us a new, he says he's gonna give us a white stone with a new name that only he knows on it. And that name is gonna be your true name, your true identity. You know, so often people, I think one of their aversions to religion is they think, I don't want to, I don't want to become a Christian because it seems so wooden. It seems like I'll be boxed in. I have to fit this kind of certain type or, or somehow I'm going, to, I'm going to lose part of my uniqueness or part of my identity. That is absolutely untrue. Listen, I'm going to read to you, and this is going to be at length. I'm going to read all 18 verses, but in Psalm 119, I'm sorry, in Psalm 139, um, uh, the psalmist lays out how it is that God knows you, to what degree. Listen to, listen to it. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high, I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. For you form my inward parts. You, ro you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. Even as yet, there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. This psalm is talking about how complete the knowledge is that God has of you. There's so many details you, ha you have never, you could never recall, you could not remember about your life. He knows them all. Things that, that are hidden, deep, dark secrets were all in the broad daylight to him. Things that you can't, that you know nothing about of how you were formed, how you were thought of, how the days of your life were ordained. Your future, things that you can't even imagine, you have no idea are in the future for you. He knows them all. He knows you so thoroughly and so completely, more than you've ever been known, and certainly more than you know yourself. And he reserves the right to define your identity, to call you who you really are. So our true identity, when we understand it, comes from God. That really is the core of who we actually are. The Bible has another way of expressing this. That in the New Testament, it begins to talk about your true identity being in Christ. So we see this phrase over and over again in the New Testament, in Christ. What it's saying is that our purpose and our true, the true revelation of who we are comes through faith in Jesus Christ. As we become born again, we begin to see ourselves in the light of the gospel, in the light of the good news, and, and, and who we really are is revealed to us as our position in Christ. Galatians 3.26 says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Okay. All right. So I want to give you another definition of identity. We, we, we looked at the traditional view of identity. We looked at the late modern view of identity. This is the Christian view of identity. Your identity is established by who God says that you are 
and your self-worth comes from being found in Christ as an adopted son or daughter. This is the truest, corest part of who you can ever hope to exist. It is the fullest expression of who you are. Let me just talk for a minute about all the ways that that's superior. All the way that your identity in Christ is far superior to any other way of understanding your identity. The, the first point is this. Identity in Christ is received, not achieved. Okay? You, you get your identity bestowed upon you. It's not something that you work. All other forms of your identity come from what can you do. Something you have to make happen or something you have to create or something you have to do, some function, some thing that you do. And, and in, in some way, it always expresses itself in being, you're, you're comparing yourself to other people. How do I fit in or how do I fit towards other people? C.S. Lewis says something interesting in, in Mere Christianity. He says, it's not so much that we value being smart as much as we want to be smarter than the people around us. It's not so much that we want to be rich, it's that we want to be richer than the people around us. And so when you're always trying to, when your identity is caught up in what you do, you're always trying to form yourself in comparison to other people. We get trapped in the cycle of work, work, earn, earn, because we believe that that's where we get our significance from. That's what defines us. The biblical view of identity is completely different than that. The biblical view of identity is, is, is bestowed upon us. It doesn't come from our achievements, which are fragile and insecure, but it is found in, in Christ and who he is. And through that, it is strong, it is secure. Ephesians 2.8 says the way we gain this identity is it for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So, so this gift of grace, this, this, this defining reality of who we are as a son or daughter, it comes as a gift. It doesn't come as something you earn. It doesn't come as something you do, as something you make happen. It's not, some, it's not based on your intrinsic value or, or your skill set or, or your, your popularity, or what family you were born into or where you come from. Your value is found as is, give, is bestowed upon you as a gift from your creator, an expression of his grace. It's received from him. It's not achieved from him. Related to that is that your identity in Christ is transcendent. That means it's rooted in something outside of this world, something greater than yourself, something eternal. Whatever else you root your identity in, I'm telling you, it's unstable. If you root your identity being pleasing to another person or in relationship to even as a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife, something, that is a dangerous place to find your identity. If it's in your career, your career is going to come to an end. We're not teenagers going through this process of self-individualization trying to figure out who we really are but we're children of God. We're eternal beings. We're going to live forever. We've been fearfully and wonderfully made and that God has an eternal purpose for us. You know, I, I'm really, I feel like God has a call in my life to be a pastor here at this church. And I'm grateful, I'm really, I, I really feel honored all the time that, that God has allowed me to have the, the ministry that I have here, and I'm, I'm hopeful and excited for the future of, of what God has for me in ministry here at this church. But that is not ultimately who I am. Ultimately, who I am is rooted in something different, something transcendent, something other than that. This could end. I could get fired. This church could fall apart. Lots of things could happen, but that does not change who I am at my core. Who I am at my core is rooted in the eternality of God in his character, in his love. And that is unchanging. I don't want to be fired, to be clear. Identity in Christ sets the priorities and agenda for everything else in our lives. You know, what I mean by that is that, is that we don't get our identity from what we do, but what we do should come out of our identity. Okay? So it's not that I can work and earn some kind of credit with God to gain some identity, but out of him bestowing on me, adopting me as a son or daughter, that informs all the rest of the things in my life, all my priorities, all the things that I'm going to do come downstream from that truth, that reality. How many of you guys just feel like you're sick of the, the rat race, the bull, just this life has a way of just beating us up? 
There's so many things that just feels like it, it can be such a grind in society. And if you're constantly trying to find your identity in something like that or in where, how you fit into that world, it really is an exercise in futility. It really will ultimately fail you. But when your identity is in Christ, it, it, is, it is an endless source, an endless fount of grace and love and hope and direction. Your identity in Christ is indefatigable. Don't worry, I'm going to define that. It means persisting tirelessly. When your identity is in Christ, it gives you the motivation, it gives you the drive to continue and press on. And in fact, you are going to spend eternity with that motivation of being pleasing to God, of leaning into him, of pressing forward. And it's never going to run out. It's never going to get old. It's never going to run dry. It is, it is persistently tireless in your pursuit of him and being pleasing to him. I want to invite the band up here. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Several years ago, I heard a story about Deion Sanders. Most of you guys, if you are a football fan or a sports fan, you probably know who Deion Sanders is. He's, he's probably the greatest defensive back maybe in the history of the NFL. And, um, and he was this incredible athlete. And just kind of, if, if Deion Sanders was on that side of the field, you just automatically threw to the other side of the field because he was that good of a, of a cornerback and defensive back. He even played both ways. He, he played for a uh, wide receiver too. Incredible athlete. But um, when he won his first championship, I heard him tell this story several years later about, it was shortly after they won the championship. This was, this was the pinnacle of his career. This was everything he worked for. Everything that he had, from, from a little kid playing Pop Warner all the way up through college, all the way up through the NFL, this was the ultimate goal. And he said he was driving one night in his Ferrari after the Super Bowl win. And he said that, that he just, he wanted to kill himself. He wanted to drive it off a cliff. Because he had gotten to the top of everything that he wanted and he realized it was nothing. Who cares? This is not what he had hoped it was gonna be. This was meaningless. His drive, his aspiration to, to, to be the best NFL player, he realized what a small goal that was. That he had wrapped all of his identity in it. And he realized when he looked in the mirror, he didn't even, it wasn't that great. He didn't like what he saw. But when your identity is in Christ, it never runs dry. When you have when you set the perfect before yourself and that's your goal, that's your aim, it never runs out. The title of the sermon this morning was The Battle for Your Identity. And that's because no matter what, everything flows downstream from who you really truly believe yourself to be. Everything flows down from your identity. What you do, what you think, how you relate to other people. And so the enemy is plenty happy letting you believe lies about who you are. And look, I want to say this morning, those lies come in different shapes. He's just as happy letting you believe that you are really special and really important as he is letting you believe that you're worthless. Okay, because he will, he will use your misery and your pain in the same way he'll use your pride and he'll puff you up. Both of those things will lead to your destruction and destroy you. He's just as happy letting you believe that you fit right into this world as he is wanting you to believe that you're rejected and unseen and uncared about, unlovable. Because both of those things lead us into a trap. Both of those things lead us into trusting our own flesh and ultimately into a lie that says that you are something that you're not. The one thing that he does not want you to believe about your identity is that you belong to God. Because when your identity is found in Christ, when you truly see yourself at your core, not for what you can do, not for what your deep feelings and desires are, but when you ultimately see deep down that who you are is who Christ says you are, that you're a son or daughter, you belong to him, you are indomitable. 
You are secure. You are fearless. I want to end with this verse, Isaiah 43.1. It says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. I have called you by name. I'm the one who really knows who you are. And here's who you are. You're mine. You belong to me. Let's stand, let's worship God.